The old basis intense pollution has meanwhile mostly dissipated. So, now we're producing at full speed again, the pollution cloud should slowly start growing towards its hopefully a lot smaller final form again. In preparation of events soon to come, we decide to send off the four brand new artillery trains. Not before long, one artillery train is positioned in each of the four corners of our base. But why? Nothing is within range. And we already got the land-based artillery turrets to keep enemy expansions in check. What's the big idea here? Oh, oh, I see. That was a fun intermission. Our base's Mickey Mouse ears are now slightly larger. But the real reason for researching Artillery Range 3 has not yet been revealed. Every mission needs a hero though, so let's proclaim these over 600 bots as national heroes of Norvis and pretend they didn't die needlessly because their overlord is too stubborn to make a more sufficient supply system so surplus slaves succumb slightly sparser. Anyway, during that onslaught we quickly built two new rocket silos nearby the labs area. Making sure we can also produce the space science pack for the infinite science projects, while keeping to our promise of letting our old legacy rocket silo rest after completing the first 100 launches. Now we need to recall our artillery trains back home though. Now you may have noticed we don't have any rail signals on our track, which means all four trains are in the same block essentially. Take that Dosh. That means they won't stop for anything, including each other. So let's hope the back trains who left early don't try to overtake the front trains. 
Alright, luckily all four trains rolled into the station sequentially, without crashing into each other. So stupendous self-shame shall stay saved. I dare you to say that line ten times in a row. Anyway, we still have 88k shells remaining. So, what now? It is still quite far to the edge of our flat world. Do we need more artillery range? No we don't. From here on out it's mining productivity all the way, so we will be giving our green base a good production test. Now rest assured I won't be taking out tens of thousands of biter bases with the artillery remote, but our automatic artillery range falls just a little short to make a biter free square all the way around this mysterious R max marker. So we do use the artillery remote control to manually punch a 90 degree angle in the exterior circle of biters. Of course, we have a radar marker in each of our four corners, so we repeat the punching out a square corner in the biters encircling us in the other three corners of our base. And that leaves us with a giant biter free square of land around the four R max markers. So then. Why exactly did we make this square? Well, it seems to have something to do with these blueprints I've been designing while you are watching the artillery go boom. So a giant bunch of laser turrets, okay, that looks like our wall design, right, let's go look on the left side again. Wait, that also looks like our wall design, so you want to expand, but why? Didn't you overdramatically say you could never venture outside of your current walls? Something about them being your final endgame prison? I, I, well, yeah, I did say that, uh, didn't I? But that still holds true, my friend. I can never leave the boundary of our current wall. But I got some friends who can. And my friends have changed out their military gear for a more, well, other kind of military gear I guess. And just like any other imprisoned megalomaniac dictator, I can still control my friends from within the walls of my personal prison. So let's go west so I can instruct my friends. The Black Widow and the White Recluse. Both of them are now outfitted with shiny new personal roboports and each of them carry supplies for their respective specific tasks. So go forth white recluse, I must stay here right on the edge of my personal outer wall, for if I don't, I will cause the expanding of the planet of Norvis, with the map generator starting to generate new land containing new biters beyond the current edge of the world. But you my friend. You may step beyond without repercussion, as the background map generation problem is my own personal curse. But not for you, white recluse and black widow, you shall go forth and expand our base a final time. Not for the resource gain, mind you, 
we are done building our base, let the era of the world extinction e e uh, world peace event begin. Alright, the white recluse has laid out a laser protected wall out to the mysterious R Max marker line. It is time for the Black Widow to take over. But what task does the Black Widow have? Well, to build our base's new outer wall. Um, looks like the Black Widow forgot to take cliff explosives. <laughs> That's embarrassing. Oh well, if you want to do a job right, you should do it yourself. But we can't. So let's call in the white recluse and see if she has some. Nice. Now the power is connected to the laser turrets and we can manually connect the oil pipeline. And after connecting the walls to this suspiciously conveniently located lake, we can start to draw the wall up north to our first corner. But being locked in this prison doesn't mean that Spider-Ben and I cannot keep ourselves busy in the meantime. Remember that we made literal boatloads of hazard concrete? Well, it is time to start utilizing that in the most useful way, or so I hope. And while Spider-Ben walks me back to my personal prison wall, Black and White are still busy expanding the new outer wall. And not before long, we reach the first corner. Gee, you would think that with 100,000 artillery shells in stock, Mr. Mike could have been a little more generous when clearing nearby nests from these corners. But no, it is up to poor old black and white spider to go and deal with it. Let's see how it goes. Well, thanks to our super fast robots with bot speed 10 and plenty of robopods and the spiders, the walls, lasers and flamethrowers were already standing before most biters even realized what was going on. Oh, now he starts clearing the nests with artillery. Well, thank you Mr. Mike.
hand, while the biters focus their revenge attacks on the corner, our spider team can happily progress with the north wall. Of course, our wall design includes radars, and of course that's what the RMAX markers are all about. Radars scan 14 chunks beyond the chunk they're placed in, which means they will scan exactly up until the world border, but not beyond. Had we gone one chunk further out with our wall, the radars would be generating additional land with their scans, but now they are placed so that their scan range exactly matches the current edge of the world. The spider team managed to place a fair chunk of new wall, but the quad wall is an expensive design. So we need to call the spiders back home to restock before they can continue and squaring the base. Meanwhile though, Mike is standing outside of the prison walls. Yes, I lied. Our real prison border is the square between the four Mike was here markers. And we already trespassed on this very terrain when taking out the biter bases with spider Ben. As the game, as a background process, slowly generates new land around the player up to 20 chunks away from the current player location, these markers logically are placed in the 21st chunk from the world border. And as we plan to get rid of our old inner wall once the new outer wall is complete, we will start drawing a new personal prison wall, this time without an actual hard wall, but with a suggestive hazard concrete instead. See it as sort of a home arrest scenario, with one of those ankle bands to keep you honest. These lines of hazard concrete are the borders we will truly have to respect for the rest of the game, as even a mere moment of stepping outside this border will immediately spawn new land and thus new biters. This must be prevented at all costs for our world peace program to be able to come to completion. I cannot overstate the importance of this fact enough. This hazard concrete border is so important to me that I'm even going to do the Canada-USA border thing and just completely cut out the forest on the border, no matter in how remote of a wilderness we are. The border must be visible at all times. Let's quickly check in on how our single flamethrower supplying pump jack is doing. Well, there's now 529k oil in the system, which is about 150k more than when we started measuring it. Incredible as it is, I guess we can call this experiment a success. Meanwhile the spiders are continuing on the wall. The personal roboports take a lot of power to operate, so I keep alternating between personally building the hazard concrete strip with spider Ben and instructing the spider team to build the wall. Whichever party happens to be on break can meanwhile recharge their personal batteries. As it turns out, the black and white spider team are not really facing any resistance from the biters, outside of constructing the corners. Well, it shouldn't come as a surprise really, as even with our climate friendly base fully operational, we are not polluting the biters at all. This means there's little risk in letting the base bots get involved in building most of the wall, instead of micromanaging the spiders all the time. So let's just already connect the roboport network, so the base bots have access to the new outer wall. By the way, the game won't let you directly build or place ghosts in the fog of war but you can copy-paste or use a blueprint to do it. 
So, instead of micromanaging the spiders, now the base bots will do all the work, slowly expanding outwards through the self-expanding Roboport network integrated in the wall design. Meanwhile, it's been 4 hours already since we started researching. The science assemblers haven't missed a beat and the labs have quickly eaten through the entire former science buffer at full speed, before toning it down and match the speed of our assemblers. Meanwhile, we are working with the spiders to figure out a way to cross those large bodies of water. The easiest solution to connect the oil to the far side of the lake seems to be just continuing the flamethrower pattern over the lake, even though they obviously don't need to defend anything there. Well, until the devs add flying biters to the game, that is. Meanwhile, the northern bots are creeping up on the next corner. And that corner is something I definitely don't want the base bots to slowly construct. So we delete the roboports from the blueprint stamp, stopping the bots from further expanding the walls. The bots can start constructing this west wall here instead. while we send the spiders over to go and deal with the northeast corner. And all the while Spider Ben and I can continue working on the hazard concrete. And so everyone is fanatically working on their own task in our happy, happy base. Meanwhile, Spider-Man and I reach the next hazard concrete corner, and the most OCD of you will already spot what I failed to see. Anyway, let's not forget to clean that concrete. And while our spider team approaches the northeast corner, it is pitch black night time, so let's quickly place the walls in the dark, they might not even notice. Oh well, I guess a lot of bugs have night vision, but we accidentally tactically make use of the cliffs by having our cliff explosives carrying white spider randomly standing exactly out of range. Once the cliffs do get blown up though, the omnidirectional lasers shine by protecting the forward facing flamethrowers from fiercely flung flumes. Well, two more chunks to go before we reach the corner. And it's an absolute storm fest. We are walling in the biters between our walls as they approach full steam ahead for the attack. RTS quick walling pales in comparison to our mighty spider wallers. And after seeing that onslaught, the east biters just give up and just completely ignore our walling spiders. Well, 
I'm going to treat them to a quick round of artillery fire anyways, to create some social distance between them and our walls. This will prevent the nest-bound peacefully roaming biters to be triggered into a never-ending attack stream by... barbecue parties happening too near to any of their nests. And by now, our new wall is nearly halfway complete. A quick retrace of our steps lets the spiders repair the wall after the biter revenge attacks. Due to the nuclear plant being in the way, we didn't have automatic artillery range on these biters on this straight. And I tell ya, this won't be the last time this playthrough the nuclear plant will turn out to be in the way of something. Meanwhile we carry exactly not enough hazard concrete to make it up to that lake. So, while we go back to resupply... Our spiders are working on the south wall, which is interrupted by many lakes. And meanwhile we connect 8 roboport lines to our outer wall, instead of relying on the single laser protected power line connection we started out with. And again, you cannot directly place in the fog of war. But you can copy paste. Only the southeast corner is left to be done now. And while the bots work on the new Roboport connections. I think we can safely deconstruct the laser protected line we started out with. But we need to make sure to keep the oil supply pipeline intact. Soon the 8 power and roboport connections are completed and the new wall is about to close its jaws in the south. It's done! Our base is now encircled by a new square wall and a new personal hazard concrete border, except for at the land beyond the nuclear plant. We might be needing that water there still to expand the power plant in the future, so I didn't want to landfill it to place hazard concrete. Anyway, why would I personally want to walk on that land all the way beyond my nuclear plant? The base is on the left side, so I'm sure not laying down hazard concrete behind the nuclear plant won't lead to any kind of problem whatsoever. Anyway, after the onslaught in the four corners, our oil reserves drop by about 60k again. But we are only expecting a single large attack still for the rest of this game. I think we will have plenty of oil remaining.
Anyway, now that the new outer wall is complete, we can start placing some pumps on the old inner wall, which will slowly start to pump out all remaining oil out of the pipes and corner tanks in the inner wall ring. That means we can clean up the last temporary connection we made when venturing out, the initial oil connection. And with the base running at full capacity for 6.5 hours now, we take a look at the pollution graph to examine the results of our green-green base conversion. With virtually no pollution being absorbed by damaging trees and by the occasional expanding biter bases, we can say that effectively 100% of our pollution is being absorbed sustainably by trees and terrain. And the flattening of the curve towards horizontal in the last hours means that we have reached our pollution equilibrium, where we are outputting pollution at the same rate as the terrain is sustainably absorbing it. I say we are good to go ahead on our final dash of destruction, to finally start actively pursuing our goals and dreams of world peace.